Got it. Here we are. Yes. Okay, so today we have the pleasure of talking with uh, Sari and Becca, who is all the way down in uh, Mexico. Um, and I would love to start right there. Down? Down. Over? Down. Over, yes. <laughs> Over, down, and around. <laughs> Over, down, and around, yeah. If, if we can start right there, how, how did each of you end up in uh, Mexico? Wow, Ooh. do you want to start, Sari? <laughs> sure. I didn't end up in Mexico. I took a big leap of faith. <laughs> um, how did I end up in Mexico? Yeah, it's a long story, but I'll try to keep it concise. Um, I have been coming to Mexico back and forth for about 25 years. My best friend is Mexican. And I always had this dream of opening, not opening, but like having a learning center in Mexico. And um, on one of my trips, I came and um, saw that there was an agile learning center in the area that I, I was visiting. And so I found out that it was run by a fellow Swede because I am also I was born in Sweden. And so I was like stalking Becca <laughs> for like a good month. And I was like, we got to meet I run a center in New York. Like, I want to meet you. I want to meet your community. And so um, we met. We were supposed to meet for juice. We ended up talking for hours. Um, at the time, I was still living in New York. I was running a center in New York and um, had the itch to leave New York at some point of my life because I was just running the New York rat race, um, unschooling my my son and um, doing all the New York things. And so when Beck and I met, a, a seed was planted there for us to perhaps collaborate in the future. Went back to New York, pandemic hit. Um, started still directing my center, co-directed my center online, but I did that in Mexico. So like took a flight, my family and I looked at each other. We're like, hell no, we're not spending the pandemic in New York. Like we're going back to Mexico, mm -hmm. came back to Mexico, was doing a bunch of stuff online, still supporting um, our New York community and involved there. And then kind of things just flourished from there. And uh, we decided to stay and um, began co like directing the, the program that Becca had founded here um, called Explora. And um, since then, it's just been a wild journey of unfolding and unlearning and relearning and reimagining and um, inventing, reinventing. And so, yeah, this is home for us now. We ended up staying. And um, yeah, what else can I say? That's, that's what brought me here. <laughs> <laughs> the short version. Yeah, the short, the really abridged version. <laughs> There's yeah, a lot. We have to start somewhere, don't we? Yeah. And Becca, yeah. what about you? And me. Well, I was living in Sweden. I was, I was, I must have been like 31 or something. And I started going into this kind of life crisis where I was like, I don't know what I want to do with my life. And I came to the conclusion that. Um, the only thing that I knew for sure that I didn't want was to continue living in Sweden. And so, <laughs> like, suddenly I had this, I had this thought in my head, which was, which was basically Mexico. And I had never been to Mexico. I didn't know anyone in Mexico. I spoke eh, some Spanish, but not really. And I was like, I don't have a better idea. I'm going to go to Mexico. And I didn't tell anyone. I think I told my sister and one friend that I knew were going to support me fully. But for the rest, I was like, I'm not telling anyone. Because if I do, they're going to tell me I'm crazy. So I left mm. and um, traveled around a little bit to find my spot. Um, stopped in the, in the city of Oaxaca. And I was like, oh, I kind of like it here. And figured out that I needed to continue work as a teacher because I, I am a trained teacher. And so I was like, okay, that was the way to get all the permits and to stay legally in Mexico. So I, um, <clears throat> I started or I continued teaching, but at university level, I was a French teacher and hated it. Uh, teaching is that kind of teaching is not my thing. And so, um, yeah. Little by little, um, I kind of decided to quit, got pregnant, had my son in 2005. So he was born in the city of Oaxaca. And that's where it kind of hit me. I was like, oh, I, I have a kid now. I do not want him to be in the traditional system. There is no way. And so that's how I ended up co-founding 
a tiny school. It was the first alternative school in Oaxaca City. And uh, after a year, it turned into a Waldorf inspired uh, preschool. And after a couple of years, uh, we were kind of like, nah, this city is growing and this is not what we wanted. And so we moved down to the Pacific Coast where I founded another uh, Waldorf inspired, inspired school and my kid absolutely hated it. <clears throat> he was seven. <laughs> and that's when we realized that, oh, not only does he hate it, he, he has autism. Uh, that must be the thing, right? Because it's, he's not behaving like others. We already knew that, but it's like when kids are, are smaller, they're so eccentric anyway. You, you can kind of like, yeah, whatever. Kids, mm. kids are, are what they are. But the older they get, you kind of get more expectations on how they, they kind of should behave. But I stuck with it. I was like, I'm running this. I need to be here. You need to be here. And we did that until he turned 10, which is where he was really just like hating life and hating me, I think, too, for forcing him to go to this awful place that he really just couldn't stand. And that's where we took um, a leap of faith and were like, okay, let's ditch this. Uh, Waldorf is not our thing. School is not our thing. And so we started unschooling. And at the same time, I was like, but what am I going to do now? All I know is how to start and run educational projects. So that's yeah. how I started Explora, uh, our agile learning center. Um, yeah. And the rest is history. Of course, a lot of stuff has happened since then. Um, I've produced a lot of content, especially in Spanish around self-directed education, unschooling. And um, when Sadi found me and knocked on the door, I was so done. I, I did not want to continue directing any kind of program. And so it was really a blessing to be able to be like, here, have the keys. Uh, I'm with you, but you do it. And so, mm. yeah. Perfect. Then we started Radical yeah. Learning. Which is also why I invited you to the podcast. Um, I, before going more into unschooling and, and radical learning and everything you do, dear, uh, as we are currently on our world travels in Sweden for two weeks, um, and, and you're both originally from, uh, I would like to ask, can we bash Sweden a little? No, 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 no I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> No, no, no. Come, come on, to the right place. <laughs> We're kind people. But uh, we we have a lot of friends. So some... can I say something? Yeah. Just to put the context for whoever yeah. has never heard about us yeah. before. We're Danish, so we're neighbors. And it's kind of fun that um, I didn't know that you were both Swedish before mm -hmm. this conversation. <laughs> so, so it's like... Um, talking to the neighbor kind of and maybe that's why you sort of want to bash we no 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 no, I, no it's not no 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 the thing is the only thing is the mandatory school the mandatory schooling the mandatory schooling is scary yeah. it yeah. really is scary yeah like for real yeah. because in sweden yeah. you can't do it no nope. there are lots of countries where it's illegal to unschool homeschool people do it anyway yeah yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm happy that you're bringing it up because this is like this has been like a, a continuous struggle that I have been in for years now. Like I have I'm like the advocate against mandatory schooling in Sweden. Uh, I have been running an account called a school from scratch for a long time. And I'm always like ve very critical towards that system and always trying to um, show them that there are other ways. It doesn't have to be like this because they have so many school wounded kids, so many children that don't, that can't go because they, they get so damaged by the system and nobody wants to look at it, which I find very interesting and also very, very kind of Swedish. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, they, like I'm, I'm, I don't know what to yeah. tell you. Like I'm, you know, I think it's easier to talk to Swedes that live abroad <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah well that's the swedes we know mo mostly yeah, because we, they moved out because they wanted to homeschool yeah in, in the, both in denmark we we have a lot of uh, political refugees from sweden who have left the country due to not being able to homeschool 
Um, but to be honest, my grandmother was Swedish. And so most of my family is from here and my father still lives in Sweden. So we we have close, close yeah. connections over here and it's beautiful. It's amazing. It's really beautiful. And I find it surprising. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm from Scandinavia. I left too because you can't you can't stay between October and March. That's just impossible. And from March to June, it's kind of not so good. And then it gets better. Uh, no, no, no. I get you. But I just find it very interesting that the two neighboring countries in Denmark, it's a constitutional right that we can teach our own. And then I, I just crossed the bridge. I mean, I can see Sweden from my home, hometown, Copenhagen. And just across the water, it's, it's fascism, isn't it? Yes, Sweden. I mean, like, it's it's really hard, but there's some kind of total, total, what totalitarian, 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 yes. There's something very, very awkward and very strange that has happened. And I, I think that, they are still not catching up with what it actually is. I think that they're still like telling themselves the story of like, we're such a democratic country, education is a right for everyone. And they haven't noticed how it's like shifted into something very totalitarian. Yeah, that's yeah. scary. Especially because it this seems that- It's happening to maybe not mandatory schooling, but the mindset of, people not really being able to have like sovereignty to be sovereign and and to have choice um, mm. over their minds their bodies I mean Sweden or with the education system it's like ext the extreme but it's happening in other places in other corners of the world as well um, so yeah it's we're, we live in a really interesting time I like to think that we're at a threshold actually um that there are people like us that are are aware that um this shit is happening <laughs> and things need to change yep. and so we're kind of taking taking reclaiming our power mm. uh, absolutely sorry we heard uh, becca's story about how she started to get into uh, unschooling due to her her son so i would love to hear yours as well you um, sounded like you already were on that track in New York? Yeah, I'll tell you my I think my journey with unschooling and de-schooling really began um well began I I was for a while I've been saying it began when I when I became pregnant because it was the first time that I really had to confront a lot of what we're talking about now like for me it was about like pregnancy and birth and realizing um the, the powers that kind of were taking away, being taken away from me um, within the birthing industry. And so um, that, you know, I decided to have a home birth and decided to kind of go like as natural as possible with my pregnancy. And that I think was the doorway into what is now unschooling and de-schooling because it was the first time that I could say like, oh no, like I'm not going to do the thing that I always thought I was going to do because somebody always said I needed to do it. I'm going to actually like educate myself on what my options are and lean into my intuition. And so, yeah, we had a home birth and then my son was born and then, you know, like, you know, medical decisions. And when he was two, I lived in New York. So it was like, you're going to gotta get on the wait list for whatever school or, you know, did you do the school visit? I'm like, he's freaking two years old. What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. There were wait lists for schools. And so I started mm -hmm. in Investigating a lot of like what the landscape of education looked like in New York. And I grew up in New York. So I left Sweden when I was younger with my family. Um, I still have all, all of my mother's side of the family is there, but um, we left, the three of us left when I was young. And so I grew up in New York and I grew up in the New York City public school system. And so I know very well what that system is about. And um, I didn't want that for my son. And so when I started looking around at what the alternatives were, I, you know, went to a Waldorf school, I went to a Montessori and nothing, it didn't feel right. It, it still felt limiting and restricting. And, um, you know, as we learn about our kids, we learn kind of what their 
who they are and what they need. And I knew from a really early age when my son was young that he has some very unique needs and I did not want to put him in a box because I knew he would not thrive. And so that's when I discovered agile learning and self-directed education. I met this you know, group in the local park and they happened to be um, like a, a cooperative um, it wasn't so much unschooling, but it was more like agile learning. And so I, we became a part of that community. I volunteered. Um, fast forward, I became the director of that, you know, facilitator and director of that community. The original founders left. Um, I took it over with a, my co, my co-director at the time. And then fast forward, fast out, fast forward, fast forward. Here I am. Um, but really, for me, from the very beginning, it became clear that uh, we wanted something outside of the system because I could recognize having having lived it myself that the system would not fulfill our needs and I really wanted to give my son the opportunity to to become and be himself and not define who he was um, but rather support him to divine himself and and grow into himself and so yeah, now I'm like really on the other extreme of, of unschooling and homeschooling where it's like we we've now um, our center is um, is now like more of like an immersion pop up community. So we don't even have a 12 month program because we recognize that there are thing, other things we want to do throughout the year and other ways we want to learn and explore and play in our lives. And so, um, yeah, it's just like this unending journey of figuring out like what 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 moves us and what speaks to us and what excites us and how we can play more um with so can, and you just, can you define for those who don't know it um the difference so what's agile learning yeah compared to the concept of unschooling and what is an agile learning center and when you say we who is that we yeah. play we want to. so that's three questions in one so yes i'll start with the first so <laughs> very professional self-directed learning um i think is is a kind of like a, a framework or an approach to looking at education and looking at learning um within that is um, our agile learning centers Right. So self-directed education, like many can consider Waldorf to be self-directed or some, you know, Montessori programs to be self-directed. If ch children, young people are able to kind of choose how and what they're learning, other people would disagree with that. But that's just the general frame. Yeah, mm -hmm. I would as well. But I'm just being <laughs> mindful of those that don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm, I am listening. And I just think we need to get the concepts clear because we're talking, but we we're within this uh, lifestyle and have been so for many, many years, but maybe not everyone listening are familiar with all the terms and the differences. So let's talk about them. Yeah. So that, but, so that's a general umbrella of self-directed, right? Agile learning is within that, which is a framework. So it comes from the agile model, which was actually um, a software and business development model that was applied to education. Um, and it's very much about like coming together in community. Um, there are tools that we use to um, to make it like a collaborative process, communication tools, but still within, let's just put it this way. There's a saying that says like, you see one agile learning community and you see one agile learning community. There is a spectrum. So there are some agile mm -hmm. learning communities that are still very much like top down, um, adults have a lot of say and influence over what young people are doing and how the space looks. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there's like, you know, more learner, um, learner voice in how the environments are crafted. And so I would say that we, when, when I say we, I mean our agile learning community, the work that Becca and I are doing, the community that we've um, cultivated um, together. Um, with others as well is more on the other end of the spectrum where now we're like playing with what what do we all want it to look like and so we still consider ourselves an agile learning community because agility is about flexibility and about meeting people where they're at um, but I would say of the agile learning world we're pretty radical in in our approach and so we don't have a full year program we you know um, have adopted a lot of principles like you know 
flying squads, like taking things from flying squads that kind of fit and work for us. We um, we do it based on like what really works for the needs of the community instead of this structure. So it's kind of like, you know, people that say like, oh, we homeschool. It's like, great. Are you doing home? At, are you doing school at home or are because you can bring school and all that school is and all the power dynamics that are happening in school home? Um, but what changes then just literally the setting? Whereas for us, it's about um, us being myself, Becca, our families, like what we're trying to do is really center relationship and center, um, center communication and center emotional intelligence and center like who we are in this world, what drives us, what moves us, what interests us, how can we play and learn together in the world. And so that might not even be here on the ground. It might be traveling. It might be, you know, taking a month um, to go do something you love. It might be resting. It might be napping. It might be, you know, playing video games for eight hours straight. Like whatever it is for the people that are involved. So that's so. Sorry. Yeah, I would, I would, I would probably add that in the beginning, like an agile learning center could be called an unschooling school many times. And that is definitely where I think that we were earlier in the history of Explora. And now it is more like leave the school part out. Um, like by, by questioning, do we really need to have a space? Do we really need to function every day? Does it have to be a place where, where parents just drop off their kids? Like, no, like how do we want to live our lives? Um, in community without having to live together and cook together and, and do all of that other stuff, but rather like focusing on as what you're saying, Sadi, like relationships, like who are we together? Mm -hmm. But just to understand it, and to be honest, I'm sure you're doing amazing stuff. And at the same time, I'm personally very resident, res have resistance to these things because I think they very often, and I hear clearly that it's probably not the case with you guys, but they become very school-ish, these structures. And I don't think it comes from the people who start it. Usually comes from the parents uh, dropping off their kids and they expect yeah. when they pick them up, they... Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally, I totally agree with you, actually. I think that it's, it's really a fine line. And I do think that some people that start these places do have very schoolish mindsets. Others don't. But the pressure from the parents of what they want it to look like to meet their needs, make it very challenging to run it in a way that maybe goes in alignment with the, the original vision. And so, exactly. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> And it's prob it is very hard structurally. I get that. Um, it's just every time we we dip our toe, get close to something like that. I I get the feeling these things. You know, you have to show up. That's one thing. You have to be there. Maybe not five times a week, but at least there's some rules of some sort. And I I think there's an anarchist gene, and I'm probably have like sixty of them. So I, whenever there's a rule, I kind of get mm, everything itches. And that's about me. I know that. But I, I get, I'm just saying I can't have it. So if, if I'm trying to find community for my three unschooled children and they have to show up, I, already that one, I'm like, mm, but no. And, <laughs> but you, yeah. they can go if they want to. But if, I, if I'm, I'm like signing off, three of their days each week beforehand promising that they will want to come then to me it's it's very much copying a system that we're trying to avoid so I'm just curious how do you do that how do you avoid thank you for that and yeah and I'll be really honest like it's been a journey and I could the 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 Saudi now is so different than the Saudi like five years ago running a center you know, where I was totally schoolish. And, you know, the agile model was like, I, I couldn't think about like leaving the cycle of learning, you know, and over the years, it was the questioning of that. 
It was the leaning into this doesn't feel right. Like, oh, my son doesn't want to go like, oh, um, he's neurodivergent and has other needs that aren't being addressed and met. Like, this doesn't feel right. And we're supposed to be in community. So it's like, now it's clear to me what schoolishness within these systems, in these programs look like. But back then, I didn't know, you know, I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And so it was part of my journey to recognize that. And we recognize that within our, within our community. And that's what led us to really want to radically change it was to question like, you know what, this thing when we get together and like have to make intentions every single day and like half of the, half of the kids don't want to do that. What, why are we doing this? Mm. Like, who are we doing this for? And so mm. anytime the answer was, we're doing this for somebody else, or we're doing this because this has been, this is how it's been done without really asking what do the young people want? What do we want as families? What works for us? Um, and that's been just an ongoing process. And I feel really good about where we're at right now because I think it's super interesting, both Beck and I, like neither one of our kids wanted to be at the Agile Learning Center. And so that was like, <laughs> okay, then what, what the hell are we yeah, doing? Okay. What's Something the point needs to this? change. Yeah. Something needs to change. Yeah, and I think also, I mean, that being said, there's so many kids that did love it and that do love it and that just thrive in that setting where they come in and there's like other people there, different ages, so many fun things to do. I think that like for me, what I understand sometimes is behind the you like you commit to being there is because at least the way we work is that we're so focused on creating relationships and creating the culture through these relationships and so if if we're running now only a four-week immersion program if kids come in once a week then they'll miss out on making those relationships and they'll miss out on the process of creating agreements that work and like how we solve problems and that is not always so easy like that can create a lot of like ah, in the process, but the, the focus is all the time. Like it's on the relationship, not on are they learning or not learning, but rather like how can we how can we exist together and and make it a smooth process for everyone, including obviously all of the adults, if they're facilitating or if they're just being parents, like how can we create a community that flows because so many people talk about community. So many people are looking for community. But if we don't shift our mindsets in how we behave towards one another, how we speak to one another, how we solve problems together, then in those communities, we're just going to repeat the same patterns that we're seeing reflected in society. Mm -hmm. So for us, that piece is like super important. How do we create, create culture? How can we like really, really focus on the relationship building piece? Sorry, just to add to that, I think a big piece, like when I think about your example, Cecile, is like, it's Cecile, right? Am I saying your name right? Yeah. Well, wow. okay. Um, is that if you are a community member, right, and it doesn't work for you to come in all the days, then that there is an opportunity for us to come together to understand those needs, not to judge them, criticize them, or like put them to the side, be like, okay, you're a valuable human, like part of this community. Like, I wanna understand what's going on for you and your family and like co-create the culture together. So maybe after we share with one another what is going on for us in our worlds and what it is it that you know, our families need, then it's like, oh, okay, well, I'm willing to X, Y, Z. And so I have to say that there are tools from the agile world that have been extremely helpful that we've adopted and have expanded on to support us to come together, to be able to share our needs with one another in a way that we can co-create the experience together. Um, and the culture together. And I find that really helpful because I do think that it is really hard to come into something when you're not a part of having created it. When you're not, when your voice isn't, you don't have a space for your voice to be heard or for your needs to be heard. And so 
um, I've always been, I do have that anarchist gene in me for sure, but I also have come to appreciate some structure when the purpose of it is to support people to be heard. And so that's kind of, um, that's the extent of the structure that, that I like to lead on. Always open for adaptation, but understanding that it's a tool and it could be used or it can't be used, but that there's purpose to that. Yeah. Where we are in our life now, we um, our children at home is 11, 14, and 17, and then we have a grown-up daughter who is 24. And we can see they just want more uh, people in the same age range they can hang out with and have fun with. Which is a quite big age range. Which, yeah. They just... Uh, <laughs> It's no. not enough with the toddlers anymore. No. So what, what we are doing is that while we are traveling, we are traveling um, uh, between people or events like there's these world school pop-up hubs that we have attended. One of them that turned in, it was uh, one month um, in, where we were immersed into being together with it's 14 cool. other families. It's, it was co-living. And it, when we talk about culture there, it was interesting to see that when we arrived, everything was new for us, but half the people or almost everybody knew each other up front. So, so and, it, and it, we didn't know. So it took us some time to come into the culture. And then there was, uh, during the one month, there was one week, there was a pop-up. Uh, and, and after... Um, evaluating it uh, it should have been in the in the start because the people who came for just one week the children they had to come into a very tight-knit group of friends and it was of course difficult so i can see how to create the culture in an immersion if people are only there for some days must be challenging that's one of the reasons why we stepped away from having a full year program is that here where we are, it's very transitory. So there are a lot of people that kind of come in and come out. And so, which is beautiful, but we were really trying to like build the on the ground community. And we were like, no, you can't come in and out for a month because it kind of shakes things up and we don't have the support to, you know, uh, co-create culture within that time frame, and then it, we were like why why are we doing this again that questioning that constant questioning like this doesn't feel right it doesn't work it, it's not working and so um really wanting to embrace and and create space for for it to be more inclusive as well meant that we had to really reimagine what it looked like and step away from this more like traditional school year um to seeing like, let's just do this pop-up, like this feels better. And it, it supports people to come for that month. You know, like if they're passing through Mexico and they're just here for a month, it's like, great, let's be in community for this month. And then you go on your way. And then some people come back because we really have built connections and then some people kind of go away. So that's the agility part that I've taken from the agile world that has really worked for me. Like not that I've um, redefined it for myself, you know, that it doesn't have to be one way, um, that it can look yeah. many different ways. And I think especially the element that you're breaking it up into smaller parts so that you can, um, it's a very interesting dynamic between the personal freedom that I think all four of us are very happy to have um and the need for community because the need for community demands some commitment that um, will take away the feeling of freedom and, and and this is it's a hard balance to find so if i am to commit for a month i'm happy to do that if i am to commit for forever itch, then i just know i can't do it when we went to that castle to co-live with 14 families for a month. Everyone were freedom people. Everyone so strange the first days. We all were like, okay, this will be fun because we know we're leaving in a month. We all felt it and, and it worked perfectly. <laughs> so yeah, I think it it's this is one dynamic that just we just have to acknowledge that it's there. I would love to talk a little about making a podcast. 
So you have the Radical Learning Podcast and we feel like newbies. Um, so how did you start on that travel and what has it changed in your uh, lives? Wow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I got the idea a couple of years ago. I think it's two years ago now. I was like, Sari, I think we should have a podcast. And, and Sari was like, why? I'm like, I just think it's a good idea. I think, you know, we talk so much and we have so many ideas and we should just record it and, and post it there. Um, mm. So that's how it started, really. Well, I think it was also because we were having these really juicy conversations and we were, you know, just being so vulnerable with one another. And as we were developing our friendship and our relationship, and it was kind of like, wouldn't it be cool to just record these conversations and share them? Because then other people would come to us with like questions or we're like, yeah, we just talked about this the other day. So um, it became... Yeah, it was just like, let's just let's just do this. And even that journey has evolved a lot. Like, I think my experience in first recording the podcast was like, very, um, like, okay, we have to, like, it was like, it was structured. And, you know, we wanted to make sure we gave like tips to people at the end. And <laughs> it was a conversation, it still felt very orchestrated in a way. Um, and then I think less and less became so because we were de-schooling our, our podcast. We were like always questioning, like, how does this feel? What feels awkward? Why do we feel pressure to have to be or say something in a certain way? Like, what is the message we're trying to get across? What is the purpose? And so I think I feel really good about where the podcast is at right now, because when we want to do it, we do it. And when we don't, when we're not feeling it, we don't. Um, and you know, we were really um, just, we're having a lot of fun with it. Like, it's just fun for us. It's an opportunity to get together and to be creative and to have those juicy conversations, but also now understanding that people are actually listening. <laughs> That's been really fun because we've had people like, thank you so much. And I'm like, oh, cool. People are listening to these conversations. So now for me, it's added this layer of like responsibility, but like joyful responsibility where it's like, yeah, like I actually have an opportunity to create an impact in this world just by sharing my voice and our voice and our stories, um, take it or leave it. And so um, it's been a playground. It's become like a little playground, which is fun. And what has, I would say what has really shifted for us is that now people are coming to our trainings and offerings through the podcast mm -hmm. and that is amazing that is really like wow so that like they if they have listened they know what we think they know more or less how how we are and they want more of that so it's it's really nice actually it feels mm -hmm. like oh they're in alignment uh, mm -hmm. before we might have had offerings and people would have come without really knowing us And they would be maybe surprised or maybe disappointed. What do I know? But actually getting people that want more of what we're already giving is amazing. Yeah. And I would say the practice of vulnerability has been huge for me. Um, because but it was Becca's idea. And I was like, I don't know. I don't think that, you know, like those voices of not being good enough and um, like being private about my things and really seeing that change within myself has been very liberating and um, being able to be vulnerable in a way that feels safe has been really, really beautiful. One, one thing I enjoy is that when we sit to record a, a podcast, um we we do it where we talk with people all the time never just us talking together um and i ponder about what we have talked about for the week after and and it has actually also drawn something into my own life when, when oh let me uh, retrace when we sit down to have a podcast some part of me is thinking okay now i actually want to learn something myself but it should also be interesting enough hopefully that somebody wants to listen to it And I've sometimes retraced that into my personal life thinking, 
so why shouldn't I have this when I'm also not having a podcast? Remember to talk with people more in depth because I'm 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 sometimes missing the the, the deeper conversations in everyday life. Um, what? My... <laughs> <laughs> You don't think so? <laughs> no, not when we, <laughs> not with you. We, we, no, we talk so much. Oh, the imagine still where they go. Go. Imagine where they go. Sorry, no, I'm just taking a Mickey out. No, yeah. no, no, no. I get you. I yeah, get yeah. you. But it, it for us, it's doing the podcasting has been kind of um focusing exercise we've also talked to people who's written amazing books and then you kind of have to sit down and read the book first um and yeah so that that part of the journey has been quite great and we meet people and yeah and i have the same experience they someone suddenly yeah. writing us an email saying that was just what they needed to hear <laughs> Before joining the the um, podcast today, I listened to one of your episodes uh, with this uh, young uh, teenagers uh, who have been uh, unschooled herself, and it made me want to talk a little about unparenting under the label of unschooling uh, because I don't think that what what she shared. I was like, that's not unschooling. It sounds more like. Uh, on parenting so how often do you meet that and see that when the people you work with or do you disagree judgmental statement you're coming yeah. out with there yeah i'm also trying to understand because my experience i think you're you're referring to the interview with ophelia yes is that yeah um ophelia is a wonderful being that i met at the asd sde weekend was it ASDE? Yeah, the ASDE SDE weekend. They were on a panel, a youth panel. And um, there was discussion around just like supporting young people to have voice in this movement. And something that I really appreciate from that dialogue, as well as the dialogue that we had with them in our podcast episode, was this understanding that the unschooling movement has been so focused on the adults. Yeah. Right. What are we doing um, to unlearn and relearn and do all the things? I mean, a lot of our work is to support the parents and the adults, but that the, this like proposing this question of who is this really for? Is it for the adults to reparent themselves and to kind of re like find like find or relive or or um get to revisit maybe some some things in their lives that they wish had gone had gone differently and do something different or is it truly to support young people to be free and so just that question that was proposed by them for yeah. me is a question that i think we really need to um focus on and highlight and um talk more about in our circles because i do see that there is a lack of representation of young people in the work that we do. And so I my hope is that more and more there are spaces that are for and by young people for them to share their voices, their questions, their experience. Um, and there are people that are doing amazing work in this. And this is something that within radical learning, we are really questioning and, and trying to understand like how can we support there to be more youth youth voice in the work that we do? And so I don't I didn't quite understand your question. Do you want to re re ask it? <laughs> I yeah, think your yeah. answer was really good. I think your answer was better than the question. <laughs> uh, and and I think what um, I I have met through our travels uh, parents who unschooled where I think that is there is this line between uh, some people. Uh, radical uh, unschoolers in a way where they mean that the children need totally freedom from everything and and I'm not all the way there because I think you you need to be true toward yourself uh, being a parent uh, but I actually think the dialogue um, you raised here is much more interesting that how much are we doing this for our own sake and our own freedom and and uh, how often uh, is it for the children's uh, 
Yeah. And I would say for our own healing, yeah. how, how, how much are we doing this for our own healing versus or not versus and how much are we doing this to truly support young people, young people, period. <laughs> um, and, and I've realized, like, like we said earlier, I mean, but neither one of our sons actually wanted joyfully wanted to go to the community that we were creating. And so that was like a hard stop for me. It was like, and I'm spending like 14 hours a day doing this work, like, and I'm not with my young person. Like, why am I doing this? Oh, I'm doing this to stroke my ego. Oh, I'm doing this because I have my own healing work to do. And so that moment was so, so huge because it was like, okay, if I truly want to support myself and my family and my son, um, then I need to actually put that time and energy in, into that. <laughs> mm. Um, mm. And, and yeah, I mean, I think unschooling, de-schooling is healing work, but it's when, when our actions, our words, our behaviors, our decisions are made just from the perspective of our own healing that I think is like a really slippery so slope. And it's something that I've started questioning more and more. So to me, our journey began when our second child was born and we had a, met a friend who was planning to unschool or at least homeschool. And at that time, our oldest child was just starting uh, in a, a radical freestyle school in Copenhagen. Um, I, I don't think it was to me a healing project when when so what happened between ours so then we had our third child and we still had this friend and it was a puzzling idea and then I had the cancer disease <clears throat> and I was lucky enough to survive it when I came back from the hospital it was an easy decision to take them out of kindergarten because we didn't know if I would survive long term so we just knew that we needed whatever time we could have together and then we had another child and then came the age of school for our second child. And he said, I don't want to go to school. It's not for me. Might be for the other kids, but it's not for me. And the short version is that we said, OK, um, we were already home, the four of us. Our oldest child was still in the radical school and she's much older. She's six or seven years older than the second one. So it was in, in a way, it did make sense for her to go do something else because the house was full of an exhausted cancer survivor with three small children. And when she was a teenager, she needed to do something else. Um, but I don't think it was ever a healing I could have done with a different kind of healing at the time. It was really hard work for me. I uh, just beat cancer, just had a fourth child, had a C-section, was completely physically exhausted and just wanted to do what made sense. And for me, the keeping my children out of the school system in the beginning, it was just my son didn't want to go. And I said, OK, you don't want to go. You can stay home. I, it, it's OK. And we did the homeschooling and transcended to unschooling pretty fast. But over the years, it's grown into, I really don't believe in the school system. It doesn't have to do with having special needs or um, delicate personalities or any kind of autism spectrum things or extra intelligence or whatever. Uh, lots of people with these situations come to homeschooling from that point of view. I think that the whole idea of the mandatory schooling, the public schooling, the forced schooling, the compulsory education is just a weapon of mass destruction. And, and we, 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 we just, I just want my children not to be part of it. Just like there are other elements in life that I would hardly, hard, hard no, that I would make sure that they didn't become part of because I believe it's wrong. Can I ask you a question mm -hmm. about that? Do you feel that that system has harmed you or your family or society in any way? Obviously, 
obviously and obviously I need healing like everyone else needs healing but I don't think that the homeschooling unschooling of my children is about my healing I think those pro processes are parallel processes I'm a mother of four children I've been a mother for more than half of my life now and it's just part of life it's not a job that I do it's not a mask I put on it's not a, an element of my personality it's just part of what it is to be human that I, I have offspring and I look after it. And, and just like everyone else, basically just like everyone else human, I have scars and I work with them and I have a personality that will unfold. Hopefully to the end of my days, I will find more nuances. And it's not all about healing and being broken and having to peel off layers. It's also just about unfolding and blooming. And yeah. But I do think, um, and, and I think that part of the work that we do is about dismantling systems of oppression. And I think that there is a part of my journey that has really recognized my um, internalization of a lot of these systems. And so when I talk about this work being healing, I'm also talking about it being a collective healing. And I do feel, and I think it's beautiful, and I don't think everybody has to feel this way, <laughs> and I don't think that everybody's journey looks the same, and I don't think everybody's reason, I'm just speaking from my personal mm -hmm. experience mm -hmm. um, in what I'm learning, what I'm unpacking and relearning, and also this sense, and I think this is going back to radical learning, this is kind of what the work that um, that moves us and inspires us is about the collective perspective. And that when we're talking about a system that is broken, we are also talking about history. We're talking about systemic oppression mm -hmm. and that as in being part of this movement, um, we are consciously, we at Radical Learning in our families, like consciously making a choice to take, like to be responsible about um, dismantling those systems. And so that has a lot of, to do with the language that I'm using around like it being healing um, is that I do believe that as we step away from these systems, it's not just about stepping away from them, but it's about changing them, uh, naming the oppression, naming our privilege, our power. You know, we're four white people here talking. And so maybe it's not so healing for us. But there are people that have been marginalized that to them, this could be healing in a different way. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that is just something that I am always thinking about now that I didn't used to think about when I first started unschooling. It was very much a me thing and me and my family and I'm doing this for us. And now I'm really thinking about like the we going back to the we like the collective and how can I support all people? <laughs> to be free. Mm. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's, I just felt that it was important to say that. Yeah. And I think that I would like to add to that, that like, for me, the de-schooling work is really about being able to recognize where I have been disempowered as a human growing up in a society that has been created through school through putting people in school? And what is it that I um, have incorporated by living in a society where the norm is going to school and where the norm is, it looks in a specific way, like how we should live lives. Like mm -hmm. you have broken free from that kind of society, so have we. And I think that still there are patterns and habits in us that are still perpetuating those those norms that we grew up with and so for me the de-schooling work is about looking at like where am I where am I being disempowering to others where am I doing harm to others without even noticing and how can I make it stop how can I change that so that I stop being part of a system that I feel has caused a lot of harm all over the world. But I totally agree. Uh, uh, degree. Agree. <laughs> degree. <laughs> Fuck. 
Okay, it's the longest night, a day. I'm, yeah, I'm it's quite there. tired. There's a lot of light here. We don't sleep. Um, no, I totally agree. And if I had a little hostility before, it's not about the whole de-schooling and healing and how, what it, I mean, I'm I'm quite sure and, and I have been quite sure for quite a long time that we're totally changing the world by what we're doing. And 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 it's it's a massive effect people like you and ourselves will have it's a huge impact on on that that very big communal society of compulsory schooling that we are all part of it's important work that we're doing just by living this life and by healing ourselves evolving learning understanding what I, I I disagreed with, at least on a personal level, is that mm, that I'm not doing it for my children. Mm -hmm. I, I, my, my, I let my children let as if as if I was the king. I'm not the king. Maybe we were kings and queens of our family uh, 10, 12 years ago when when they were newborn and we were beginners in this journey. But our kids are not in school and they can do whatever they want, basically, as long as no one is hurt and, and we're all safe and it's within the budget. And and um, that's how, that's the frame, <laughs> basically. Yeah, yeah. And, I think, and, and that's I think what unschooling looks like for us. And that's yeah. not about my healing no. at all. It's I think that what I, what, what I hear from you is like, you're following your kids. Like when your kids said, I don't want to go to school, you were like, cool. And I yeah. think that that I was, is I was very, not super cool with it. Cool to, I, 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 <laughs> okay. But anyway. It took some time. <laughs> I said cool. You he did, said crazy. Yeah. And then we yeah. worked from yeah. there. Here. <laughs> yeah. But I think that that is like, like when we listen to our kids, when we observe them and when we like follow their lead, that is where, that is where it is. I mean, like, I don't want to say that there's a right or wrong way, but that is what I want to go from. Like, I want to listen to my kid because I didn't when he was younger. Um, I was I'm not going to say that I was convinced that it was the best for him. I saw that he was suffering, but I couldn't imagine how I would like get out of what I had created. Like, I felt so much responsibility for all these other families. Mm -hmm. And so like what feels really good for me and I think it is the same for you. And I think actually, Sadi, it's the same for you too, that we're in tune with our kids now. We're listening to what they want. And that is very different from other parents that I have observed. And I don't want to judge them, but where I see that they have an idea of how they want to live life. And they think that it is the best. And it, they think it's going to give their kids freedom, but they haven't checked in with their kids. Mm. And I think yeah. that I think that that is like that is what I, I think it is quite common. And that is what I heard from like when we were talking to Ophelia, that they were like, mm, like their mom did not ask if it was OK to unschool. If Ophelia had had a say, she would not have unschooled. And I think that I think that it is something that is important to talk about. Like, what do we do as parents? Are we doing this because we find it's a really amazing idea? Are our kids on board? Yes or no? Like, is there consent? Yeah, I, I, I just think it's a it's a slippery slope with the small ones because when children are small, when they are four, five, six years old, they're surrounded by a, a, a society with the school as this huge axiom. It's just it it just penetrates everything, especially around small children. And they are already being trained that they should be proud to be a little older. They should be proud to have the next skill. They shouldn't play with someone three years old if they're five. And they're already, you know, exercising this idea. And everyone around a five-year-old will be all excited about, oh, you're starting school this, this August. Aren't you just... 
happy about that. That will be fun. Did you get a new box for your pencils, whatever? And and everybody is so excited about it. And in, in the supermarkets, the spot things that you can get only this week will be the little trainee math thing. And they can sit and play school in the summer break. And everything is, it's it's just such a huge machine. And I think we have to save our children from that. I, I, I think actually that parents are allowed to not ask them at that point because they are too small to understand what they are actually entering, what, what they're machine, fighting against, what yeah. they are yeah, fighting I, against. And, and I, I think we have to save them from that. I hear but what you're later saying. Later on, you can ask them. And I and I would I would agree with that. Like I didn't ask three year old Sai if he wanted to go <laughs> pre-K or whatever. You know what I no. mean? Um, Definitely. I think there's like certain um, moments where you begin to have conversations with your young people, depending on their development and their understanding. But I do think that there are tools and I, I call them tools because I've come to use them as tools, whether somebody sees it and uses it or, you know, agrees with that or not. I'm just speaking from my perspective that like Becca touched upon consent. Like, I think that there's still a lot of things that we adults have internalized and um, ways in which we we have communicated or have learned to not communicate with our young people that we can begin to change without having like explicit conversations with their young people about what it is that we're actually doing. You know what I mean? So it's like consent, it's like you can still develop a culture and a practice of consent with your young person um, when they're, you know, when they're younger without having to name it as such or without having to to say like I'm going to ask you for your consent for every little thing like I think if you look at your family as a culture or your relationship as a culture like there are still things that we can begin to craft and develop and undo from our past experience as we bring it into parenting that has nothing to do with sitting and saying like hey do you want to go to pre-k um mm. and I think that that's to me also what I consider as the de-schooling work is like looking at how we, how our person has been affected by these systems and what is the language we're using? What are the actions? What is What are our behaviors? What are our thoughts as we are interacting with our young people and how we can like shift that so that it's more equitable. And so that, you know, when they are old enough to have conversations like, hey, these are the choices I've made for these reasons. Like, what do you think about it? Like, do I ask my son all the time, like, do you want to go to school? Yeah. Like, if you want to go to school, like, I support that. Like, if that's an experience you want to have, we're going to have many conversations around it. But um, yeah, I think it's, it is really important to think, to constantly think about the why, like, why am I doing this? Why is this important? Who is this for? How am I, um, how am I communicating? I have a question about uh, anxiety and support and fear. And it, it's no, no, it, just to phrase it, dum, 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 dum. no, no, the thing is uh, taking home the responsibility of uh, your child's uh, life as, as you do as a stay at home mom, dad, uh, homeschool, unschooled parent. It is terrifying. I know we are sitting here and we seem kind of uh, relaxed and cool about it now, but but I remember uh, I was I was scared, uh, and I I needed in our life I needed Cecilia to do more homeschool based in the start because uh, that was what I was growing up with and what I knew as being okay. If they can do their math, if they can read and write, then then I feel more safe. And and not to go into our personal story, how it developed, but how do you, when you support the parents out there, you help, uh, how do you, what tools do you talk with them about? Because it is scary to take home the responsibility. It's so much easier just to put a, your child in school and think now everything is all right. And yeah, you like peeing your pants. It, of it's not course, easier. It, it is mentally easier <laughs> at, the, at the point of doing it. You feel that it, you've placed the responsibility somewhere else, but taking it home is scary. Yeah, I believe it is. You just can't get Thank it. Real. Thank you for saying that and for voicing that, because I don't think that many people, especially male body people, say that. And so thank you 
for naming that. Yep. Yeah. And I think that like what has been the focus from the beginning has been like I'm big on catalyzing thought processes in people. I am not here to tell people what to think or what to do. But what I really enjoy in our work is helping people um, figure that out for themselves. Like, how has how was it to go to school? Like, what is it that you really learned? Uh, like, of all the stuff that we went through during our 12 years in school, or I don't know how many years, you know, depending on, on the country and the system, like, how much of that do you really remember today? Like, and when we think about it and we're like, oh, actually, I don't remember so much of that. Why did we have to spend so much time on it? And do I really believe that I can't learn these things as a 45-year-old or a 52-year-old? Do I think that I can only learn these things there? Like starting to really think about what is it that we learned in school? Was it really content or was it the context? Mm. And so by, by supporting the thought process in people, uh, letting them come to those conclusions themselves where they're like, fuck, what I learned in school was to sit still, shut up and copy. <clears throat> and if I made a mistake that was punished, why? We make mistakes all the time living life. We're not punished for it. Actually, that is where we take so much learning from and so I think that basically like what we do in our work is is supporting people to think for themselves because the fact is we were not taught to have critical thinking the school system was never built to develop critical thinking on the contrary it was developed to hinder critical thinking and so when we have all these questions like and all these fears come up it is just proof how the system really works. And so, yeah, it's about learning how to, how to critically think about our upbringing, our learning process, how it really happens. And um, yeah. Yeah, I would add to that. And the reason why I just wanted to take a moment to thank you for, for your vulnerability, Jesper, is that I think that um, it's really important. And this is kind of goes into what we were talking about before about the healing work. Like, I think it is important to take time and create space to think about how we have been impacted, like Becca was saying about the, from our own schooling experience, even if we didn't go to school, you know, like whatever it looked like, because those fears, like, so it's something like that. My first go-to, my first um, curiosity is like, what happened? Like, what are you scared about? Like, what is fearful for you? Like, let's talk about it. Let's unpack that and understand what that fear is about. Because unless we do, like, we don't do that work, then we're just kind of covering it up. And that is when we start to unschool for ourselves because we're not really dealing with all the things that are coming up for us, but like kind of pushing through. And it's almost like this barrier, like that doesn't help us connect with our young people and our unschooling process. And so I think like in terms of tools, vulnerability is a big one. Honesty is a big one. Um, communication is a big one, like just holding space uh, for us to, to just understand how we've been impacted and be okay with that. Like something that I find really scary talking about fear in the unschooling world is that there is a lot of dogma and I've been guilty of that myself, you know, in my process, but this idea that it has to be one way and it has to look a certain way. And that unschooling is defined as such. And it's like, who the fuck decides that? Who defines what that is for anybody? You know, who's to say that one person is unschooling better or worse than the other? It really is dependent on like your family and what works for you. What I will say is that for me, like a core value of unschooling for me and my family and our community, our shared community is consent and is also 
like honesty, like raw honesty about who we are and how we're showing up in that moment. And so I think when I hear people say like, I'm scared of shit, it's like, good, you should be. That means you're in it. Mm. You know, if you weren't like, oh, this is easy. This is great. No, I'm going to do this thing. And yeah, and blah, blah, blah. but you're not dealing with that. Like, then that's, that's also how we've been programmed to be by the system. It's like, just shut it down. Put that away. Not, yeah. Put that away. No, you're scared. Mm. Congratulations. Mm. Like, I mean, you- if I could, if I could meet myself back from when we started and say to myself, you know what, in 10 years, you were just in love, enjoying living your life with your children, not caring if they learn anything because you trust in them. I would look at myself and think that guy is crazy. I need some structure here. I need I need to know that it's going. And I mean, it's kind of a hard advice to give people. It's like, do you want to unschool? Yeah, just chill. What yeah. should I do with my kids? Whatever. Just have fun. Enjoy your life. It will all work out. And now we can see it actually can work out. But man, I'm not sure I could have uh, listened to it back in then. In some ways, our perspective is... Mm, I don't know. We've known each other for an hour. So <laughs> let's be fair. I don't really know. But um we we actually I think we succeeded and we keep succeeding because it's an ongoing process to take the idea of school out of our lives. Mm-hmm. The idea of uh curriculum, the idea of learning as a goal in and of itself. And also the idea that we, the adults, get to decide. Um, We don't work with the idea of consent. I'll have to think about that for a while after this conversation. Um, I I use the word voluntary uh, Mm -hmm. a lot. Um, Maybe it's also different because we are a larger family. As I understand it, you each have one child, which is very, very, very different structural situation because we basically have chaos that's it and now that they are a little older we have a very beautiful peaceful chaos but we don't get to decide what's going when 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 you have four small children at the same time it's basically just cooking meals and putting out fires and and cleaning the floor and washing the clothes it's it you can't it's it's different it really is different and they have all the there's so many more relations within the family so many more dynamics so much going on it's very different so maybe that's why consent is like (laughs) between two persons and, and we are just this huge wobbly thing so that might be the reason i don't know I'll have to think about I that. Don't know, yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think so, actually, Cecilia, because if you run a center that we have done, that has been consent-based, consent and then you have a lot more kids than three or four, you know? But what so I, I think, I think, it's, um, I think it's, it doesn't, it, it's not about, like, the amount of people. I think it's, uh, it might be only a, a, a difference of wording. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know, because we don't know each other that well. Yeah. Not, not young. Yeah. We're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> but the other thing is that we took the idea of, you know, learning is not really part of our equation anymore. We mm. don't get up in the morning and unschool. <laughs> it's not, I mean, yeah. it's not what we do. It, it, unschooling is not a thing we do, it's a thing we don't no, do. No, I think that we live. Like mm-hmm. we in, in in I don't think in our families that we think a lot about learning uh, per se. I think in the beginning it was like I didn't think like, oh, he now we need to do these specific things because Theo and I have never, ever sat down to try to do like concretely learn something. Um, I think in the beginning I was a little bit more like concerned of the things that I thought that maybe he would need um but we never did any any learning until this day we just live Mm. we just live our lives and then he is very focused on very specific uh subjects and topics like that he themes that he finds fascinating Mm. and he's learning toms but it has it doesn't look like it doesn't look like 
what you do in a school and it is nothing like it has nothing to do with what you do in a school because it's it's his specific interests and those you can't even study in school to me it's um, all so about think, the agenda so huh? the agenda is the, to me it's all about the agenda is there a, yeah. a learning agenda or is there a living yeah. agenda is it about yeah, exactly. being passionate about something and being really interested in something and yeah. therefore diving into it then we sit down and learn we sit down and study yeah. stuff within our family because something is fascinating but we're not doing it because we have to learn something no that, we don't do that either. <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 we don't do that either. something yeah, not that at all. is important to me my family our our community oh is um understanding power and I alluded to this, or I spoke a little bit to this. And I think for me, unschooling, de-schooling is not about learning. Well, it is about learning in the sense that it's opportunity to learn about ourselves and each other in the world, right? Like we, we, we focus on living, which um, gives us those opportunities once we lean into living and like we stop putting energy into other stuff. Um, but for me, what I've learned is that my journey has been so much about recognizing my power and recognizing how those systems. So it's like, we're all, we're all in agreement. Like we don't believe in the school system and we've stepped away from that. And we're mm -hmm. trying not to like repeat those systems. Right. But for me, it's about recognizing the power, like how we've been disempowered by those systems and how we disempower through those systems and we can step away from school and we can forget about like the curriculum and we can just focus on living but if we aren't relating to ourselves to each other to our young people in different ways that are not based on power and adult supremacy because that's really yeah. what we're talking yeah, about yeah that's a hard one yeah then like then what are we doing? <laughs> we're just living so without we're not changing a lot. If we're not walking away from the ageism concept, yeah, uh, that's for sure. That's for yeah, sure. and I mean, it's great. we're stepping away from school, which is awesome. For me personally, unschooling is more than just not going to school. It's about unearthing that and recognizing, like, okay, where where am I disempowering myself and others? And what can I do instead to make it more equitable? And so we can actually share our lives and where mm -hmm. I'm not like, mm -hmm. you know, telling my kid what he needs to do at the same time, being really clear about what my boundaries are. Like, I need to go to bed right now. Like I have to wake up in the morning. It does not work for me right now. You know, so mm -hmm. talk going back to your question, Jesper, like the tools, like, you know, nonviolent communication and decolonize nonviolent communication specifically somatics, intuition, like all of these have been huge tools for us as we develop our own unschooling language and ways of unlearning and relearning together. Mm. Sounds like you're having a lot of fun. Yeah, and fun and play. It's <laughs> <laughs> actually it. really hard for me. Like I didn't grow up playing. I was an only child that started working at 13 in Brooklyn, New York. Mm -hmm. And so play was hard. Like when I started facilitating and, you know, even in our unschooling life, like it, it was hard for me to play. I didn't know how mm -hmm. to do it. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't do that so much as a kid. And so mm -hmm. it's been a real like journey of reclaiming play in my life, which has been yeah. beautiful. Wonderful. I think we kind of have to reschedule. Yeah. Or not re, but no. extra schedule. It's, it's not like always, not like always, but it happens quite frequently that it yeah. uh, seems like we could talk another two hours. Yeah. We should do that on another day. I would love to do that on another day. But uh, for for ending the this podcast episode, I would love for you to say a little about radical learning and how people, if they enjoyed the connecting, listening to you here, can get in touch with you. Becca, you want to go for it? I can go for it. So first of all, uh, would be to check out Radical Learning Talks, which is our podcast. 
Um, it's bi-weekly, or at least we try to make it bi-weekly. Bi and there's just a lot of juicy stuff in there. So many different topics we talk about and also a lot of interesting interviews. And then I would go to Instagram because that's where we're having a lot of fun. <laughs> we're having a lot of fun on Instagram and it is basically the, um, yeah, like radical underscore learning. And that's where you find us. And if you want to check out our website, it is radical-learning.org. And that's where you can find like our offerings when we do group coaching sessions or trainings uh, in person. And um, is there anything else we should add to this study? I want to talk about how much fun we have with our offerings specifically and offering the shift is a seven day de-schooling intensive. Um, we just finished one in which we collaborated um, with My Reflection Matters and Cocos de Oro Unschooling Community in Borique, Puerto Rico. And um, we just have a lot of fun with that. Like it's a lot of play. It's a lot about like looking at these things that we're talking about, like systems of oppression and different communication and um, what does unschooling mean and look like for us and how can we um, build community? Because it, it is so much, help. it's helpful when we can connect with one another like this, like, hey, you're doing the thing. You're like, mm -hmm. you know, how's it going for you? What's working? What's challenging? Um, so yeah, that that training, we we're done for this year, but hopefully next year we'll run a few. Um, and if you're interested in, anybody that's listening interested in us bringing it to your community, you have like a serious, de-schooling group of people like reach out to us we're also open open to that um so yeah and then Thanks. we have our group coaching program which is fabulous and one new starting up in october and that is not uh, in person it is online but it is uh, live and it's a really really amazing three month long program perfect and yeah. we should end it here. And I, I think we down the line in our podcast should uh, take at least one more talk. It has been a big pleasure. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for having us. It was fun. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. And if you liked it, then please share it with all your friends and family. We would also love it if you gave our podcast a review. Thanks. And if you want to support our podcast and work, then you can find us on patreon.com slash the Conrad family. We will continue to travel full time. And if you want to tag along, then please follow us on Facebook and Instagram at the Conrad family. And you can also read more than 100 blog posts on our website, theconrad.family. Until next time, make a wonderful day. Thank you.